week's podcast is Dr. Rajendra Gupta. He is a uh, fellow astrophysicist cosmologist from the University of Ottawa. And earlier this year, actually, in July of this year, he released a paper that will be linked in the description below. Basically making us question everything we understand about the current universe in terms of our models. The name of the paper is the James Webb Space Telescope Early Universe Observations and Lambda CDM Cosmology. He actually didn't even know it was going to get as big as it did because what it basically outlines is that using these new models that fit the new data that has come from the James Webb Space Telescope, that the age of the universe is actually twice as we think it is. So instead of the current 26 point, or sorry, 13.8 uh, billion years old, he proposes the age of the universe as 26.7 billion years old. So in this podcast, we speak with him primarily about the paper and the models leading up to this paper. So yeah, enjoy. It's the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Welcome back to another episode of the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you to episode number 114, where today we have Dr. Rajendra Gupta on the podcast here with us. So Rajendra, how are you doing today? And welcome to the show. I'm doing great. Thank you very much for inviting on your show. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we're very, very excited to have you here. So apart from being an astounding astrophysicist, the main reason of contact was uh, your paper earlier in this year itself. Basically, I don't want to say redefining, but basically uh, questioning a lot of the our, our understandings of the early universe. And a lot of the current models that we have are kind of futile maybe one would say with the current new observations being seen from the james webb space telescope that came out of your paper so basically we contacted you because of the because of the popularity of that paper and obviously what that paper says it's quite quite an interesting paper parker and i both kind of skimmed through it and i would recommend anybody in the audience also just to give it a give it a quick read if you can't go through the technical stuff just an introduction and maybe the conclusion would be sufficient but uh very, very interesting paper that I really want to get into. But maybe before we get into like the real nitty gritty of the stuff, which everyone wants to get into, let's try and backtrack into see how did you even get there in the first place? So this is a question that we ask a lot of our guests, and I would love to ask it to you as well, which is how did you get in the field of science? What kind of motivated you, inspired you to start getting into to science? And how did that lead you to where you are today? Uh, that's a very good question. I was raised in, brought up in India, um, and there, you, there are two careers which were parents will say you sh should choose either go medical or engineering. Mm -hmm. So somehow I couldn't really qualify in any of the good engineering institution. I couldn't enter, so I had to continue with the. Uh, the science and biology, I was very interested, but I was not good at it. Okay. Mm. So if you don't get good marks, then you you try to choose something else. Mathematics, I was okay. So I said, okay, let me try to pursue mathematics. However, I didn't do very well in physics initially because my teachers were always telling every time they will go to a chapter and tell me, tell everyone, this is harder than the previous one. Now, I didn't understand even the previous one, so how would I understand the harder one next? <laughs> so essentially, I thought I have to see what I can find which is easier. So mm -hmm. I went and looked into something more ahead. Maybe there is a chapter which is easier I can understand. So I found some chapter which I could understand. 
And then when that chapter was get, getting taught in, they say, it is harder than the previous one. I say, if I can understand this one, then I'm sure I can understand other ones. And that's what got me interested in physics. Awesome. So you also mentioned that you took a look at biology. Was that even after realizing that, you know, maybe I'm not getting the best marks, was it something that interested you more than physics? Um, I wouldn't say that, but you know, biology is all around you. So it definitely it is very intriguing how it exists, what, what makes it grow, what is life and all those kind of things, there's a curiosity. But then you have to go beyond the curiosity and see that what you are can do, what you are capable of handling. And I obviously had more interest in uh, the nature of things rather than uh, biology of things or something you might say. Mm -hmm. So I, more, basically I was more interested in physics. I, I didn't mm -hmm. know it is called physics at that time when I got interested. Oh, okay, so it was just kind of exploring the mechanisms behind that's how right. how the world works, and that's what yes. got you into, you know, saying, "Oh, let me let me understand maybe how the the dynamics of objects or wave dynamics," and then kind of spiraled into where you are now today. I did do a lot of engineering stuff too later on. And, okay, uh, basic engineering, how to design certain things and all that, but that was not as an engineer, but as a physicist, mm. how to improve something, you know, as okay. it existed. So I have done that kind of work. And not only that, I have taught engineering, by the way. At McGill University, I was adjunct professor. I was, I was uh, adjunct in electrical engineering there. Oh, wow. So, so I taught a lot of things in, in that field. So, you know, so, but basically the background was a strength in physics. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how would you say your engineering or your, I mean, I guess not inclination, but the fact that you did a little bit of engineering afterwards, how would you say that has affected your current understanding of all of your research? Has like being in different fields helped you with this field? Actually, you might say all the fields create challenge when you want to solve certain problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my my engineering involvement was not to design something which is conventional, but troubleshoot some certain things. If there is a problem, can you resolve those problems in mm -hmm. some way? So there was okay. a physics behind the engineering problems, not the engineering behind the physics problem. Although without engineering, physics cannot advance. Of course. We have to understand right. that. J James Webb Space Telescope is engineering marvel right this is we, and we are using it in physics so i'm not underplaying in any way engineering part it is extremely essential for us right to we, progress we spoke to uh dr don feiger who is a scientist who worked on james webb he was a part of the detectors that are on james webb and he spoke about how you know a few years into the development of james webb he felt like his job was done right all of the science was known the, the science that was required to build the telescope was known afterwards it was just an engineering problem so you know you put it up to the engineers and now it's their job to figure out how to actually get it into space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's true, true. And that's the big challenge to really, yeah. <laughs> you know what happened with the Hubble telescope. It, it had a lot of problem when it was launched and it had to be corrected, corrected, corrected. And eventually, yes, it worked very well and it really provided so much information to us. But really, that fortunately, maybe we learned from that, this $10 billion dollar toy we couldn't have afforded to to not work correctly especially it was not even in in geocentric orbit it is heliocentric orbit so it becomes very difficult to make any correction if it has right. to be yeah so i think it was it is an engineering marvel i think so and do you remember sorry um go ahead. When the James Webb Space Telescope was being launched, did you have an idea for, you know, some research that you would want to do with images that come from the telescope? No. No. No, not really. I I wasn't sure because I I'm more interested in data which is already there 
uh, and somewhat processed rather than starting from the the raw data. Mm-hmm, I, right. I don't have capability and I, I am, um, there's no significant program here. Actually, there is no program in at the University of Ottawa in astrophysics. So I am alone with my one of my student, graduate students and some undergraduate students. That's, that's all we have. So it is, to really process the data from the telescope requires a lot of expertise, which we don't have. Right, right. So we are counting on the data which is available and somewhat processed, and people have already published work on that. So I took that data and and did the analysis. Uh, Sorry for the interruption, guys. This episode is once again sponsored by Brilliant. Thank you so much to Brilliant. Everybody keeps asking me, where can I learn more about math, physics, computer science, astronomy, and the list goes on. And every single time I say, hey, check out Brilliant. It is not like learning in school where they say, here's an equation, just go and solve it. No, the lessons are interactive where you can actually go in and play with the concepts yourself. And personally, that is the best way that I learn and retain the information. So if you want 20% off your first year over at Brilliant, please use brilliant.org slash MPP. The code will be in the description. Once again, 20% off. You can't find this deal anywhere else but here on the Math and Physics Podcast. Back to the episode. So... These yeah. early observations from JWST, the, these were this was already like uh, processed data. Is that is that right? No, people were already those who were involved in uh, James Webb yeah. project. They were looking for the data as it was coming in, and they mm-hmm. were processing, and then then they were trying to put that into perspective. So this was already being published, you know. Okay. So it came to my attention, and I, I do monitor the papers as they come out. Mm-hmm. Every day I monitor uh, what is going on. So, yes, so I was seeing what the problem they were having, why they were not very happy with the models, existing models, which were not able to, exp- seem to have not ex- able to explain their observation. And that was right from the very beginning, in July last year, James Webb started sending data, and soon after that, you could you could see the scientific astronomers who were involved with that were very concerned that it is not really delivering what they were expecting or what they were predicting mm-hmm. in the, from the their models. Mm-hmm. So that was a a very well known thing which is happening. So so a lot of papers were coming which were trying to explain it. There were other which were questioning the 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 uh, those models and why these observations are what they are. Right. So, are there a lot of papers coming out presently that are kind of exploring the same avenues that you have? Actually, they are trying to figure out what the problems are. What are the problems? Most of them are trying to find a way to explain these things using existing models. Mm -hmm. That maybe the parameters we used in these models were not right. We have to make some adjustment in these parameters. So most of these are like that, but many others are also of the type which are saying, No, you are stretching the parameter too much. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's not really right. There's something is definitely doesn't jibe with the model. So Mm -hmm. that's the kind of, you might say, tussle or differences which are going on between astronomers at this point. But the models, I, I think the kind of model which might explain some of the things, I haven't seen something which can explain the problem the way I have tried to explain in my paper. That particular problem has not been explained, which will, actually, I shouldn't say that. 
I came across a paper which explained the James Webb data. Okay. Okay, that was in around November, December last year. I came across that paper and explained that data. But as far as I could understand, this could not really fit some of the existing data which which astronomers were able to fit. And they were very critical data. They should be any model which wants to qualify for a, a serious model should definitely mm -hmm. fit those data which are already explained by the standard model. But it could not explain that. So naturally, it came to me that perhaps we have to combine the two models, the model which explained the James Webb data and the model which explained the other data. Can they be combined in some way to explain both? Yeah, you please ask your question. So, so when you, sorry, but uh, when you see something like this and be like, oh, this data is just completely out of our sc current model scope and it looks like we're stretching these parameters too much as you mentioned or we might have to make a new model what's the first thing i'm just, just curiosity what's the first thing you do do you like go and contact people like hey do you also see this weird thing or is it just me like do you talk to your peers about this as well or is it just like you want to keep it as close as possible until you publish like how does that whole process work once you once you've got this new data how do you go across actually, you know, implementing it in a theory or a model? See, one of the things is this. Um, you have to be yourself very confident what you are proposing is reasonable and that it has been peer-reviewed. I could be making a lot of mistakes and creating a model which really is, is because I think it is right, but really it is, something which I have made some mistake in. That's why I am saying it is good. So I think before we'll, you you can talk to people, and if, if, if I'm at Harvard University, we have 200 colleagues who are working on that. Yes, I will discuss that with them. But when am I isolated, when I start saying something, nobody will believe. They say, we have so many people working on it, so what are you suggesting us? We could have thought of that too. But really, it's not that. This is this is normal process. I also get so many emails and so many suggestions and how they can explain everything in the world. Because if I read all that, I will be I will be not able to do any of my own work. Mm -hmm. So naturally, people who are at high places they get a lot of such kind of inquiries. So best is to really first have it vetted by expert, that means you publish it in a reasonably well-known journal. Then people take it seriously. And then, even then they might not notice unless this kind of buzz is created, which our media relation people created. You wouldn't be talking to me if you didn't hear in the news this kind of thing, because you wouldn't be reading my paper. Right. There are thousands of paper coming every day. How many can you read? Right. Have you received any constructive criticism after publishing your paper that has influenced, you know, the direction in which you're taking your research now? I have received very good comments. I, in, even the referee, when he was reviewing the paper, he gave a lot of good comments. He or she, I'm not sure, uh, or they, uh, if you want to have gender neutral. And, anyway, so... Yes, I have, in even after this uh, uh, media buzz which was created, and there are a lot of videos I have seen, a lot of, um, uh, you might say, a lot of public, a lot of uh, news items, you might say, or some blogs or something in which people are writing uh, uh, about my paper. I have, I have seen about more than 50 videos which have discuss my thing and hundreds of other items and yes some of them are very good criticism which really helps me see what i should be doing next to really establish what i have done on a better footing so yes but a lot of them criticism are because people have not read the paper 
properly. Right. I will give an example. People will say, oh, you have used too many uh, parameters to fit uh, the data. They have not seen, they have not read. I have clearly written in, in the table there, it has the same number of parameters, that is two, as any other model which is being used for, for this fitting of this kind of data. And, but they don't, they think I am using whole lot more because the kind of things I'm doing, it cannot be perhaps done with two parameters. But that's the beauty of it. Although I enlarge the scope of the model by including the tired light, by including the covariant coupling constants, it does not increase the number of parameters. If it did increase, then it's not a model. It will not even, my, my peer reviewers of the paper will perhaps not process it. They perhaps will not publish it or allow it to be published. So the thing, that kind of thing is one of the thing which kind of oh, people misunderstand. So apart from like the, the, the misunderstandings because people haven't read it, is there any like actual backlash that you have received from any of your peers or any of your, any, any people that you know? Because this paper challenges, as I mentioned in the start of the podcast, a lot of fundamental ideas of our universe. Right. So I would just like such as your your uh, covariant uh, constants. So m I guess my question is, like, did it did any of your mates, <laughs> you know, tell you, oh, by the way, I think you you, you might have messed up or did anyone s give you basically backlash in a way where they've actually, you know, informative backlash? Um, informative backlash is usually. I have, I have some very important uh, people who have read this paper. Uh, Brian Keating is one, for example. He, he's, he's the uh, professor of astrophysics um, uh, at which university? Some, from the University in California. I, I very, the name. There are so many famous universities there and I, I'm not uh, remembering, but uh, yeah. And then there's Avi Lord. As you know, he he's very well known. He's at Harvard. Um, right. He has provided some criticism. There are other people who have discussed this, and 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 uh, I think their their concern had been of the type which I can easily answer. So they are based on one thing. Most of them are based on the fact that tired light, which I have used to hybrid it with the existing models, that tired light had certain definite issues. And those were, they are always trying to, oh, tired light cannot explain the uh, time dilation. It cannot explain the Tolman surface brightness. It cannot explain um, the, uh, the, uh, the light or uh, observe, observed images not getting blurred, mm -hmm. for example. Because initially when it was proposed, all these things were not so significant because telescopes were not. And some of the things were not definitely, couldn't say that it is, it, it is a problem. But as telescopes became more and more powerful, the entire light became out of fashion, you might say, uh, or it, it couldn't explain or, uh, the observations. However, when tire light was able to explain the JWST observation in one of the papers which I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, then it appears to me it has some something which it can do. So it means maybe that you require more than one thing which is creating the red shift which you observe of the light. Not only the expansion of the universe, but maybe partly the tired light as well. So this is, this is not, not, not new. For example, if you go back to the time of Newton, he proposed the corpuscular theory of light. The light travels as particles, and it prevailed for almost 100 years, 
But when diffraction patterns were observed, then they could not be explained so well without the wave uh, nature of the light. Then for the following 100 years or more, it was the wave light, wave theory of light. Then people observed the photoelectric effect and it could not be explained with the wave theory of light because they tried to experiment assuming wave theory of light kept increasing the intensity and still there were no emission of photoelectron until some wavelength was in, uh, reduced and frequency was increased to some level and Einstein then explained it using the particle theory. Now we know all of us we know that all particles behave like particles as well as as waves. Mm -hmm. Not only photons, but all the particles behave like that. So this way, I would say, when I invoked the theory which was rejected for almost hundred years, then I think it may not be totally, totally unprecedented mm. thing. It has been done before. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the covariant coupling constant. About the covariant coupling constant, this is another thing which people say. Oh, there have been so many observations, but nothing has revealed that these constants vary. They have been done on lab, they have been done in, in, uh, in the sky, in, the, in, in cosmology, astrophysics, everywhere. It doesn't show it varies. Yes, but they have assumed Dirac, for example, had predicted that that the constant vary. If the universe is expanding, then constant should also vary based on his large number hypothesis. However, it has not been observed, especially the gravitational constant for sure. Gravitational constant, my when I studied it, I found the and not only me, this has been Philip Ozan uh, in France who also projected that constant, if one constant vary, then others would also vary. The problem is, uh, what I did before this paper, two years before that, this paper, I had projected the variation of constant, they are interrelated, they are co varying and covariant that means they are interrelated through a single function. This function is the one which determines if the variation of all the constants. Not, it could be squared in some places, it could be cubic at another places, but this is the function which is determining the variation. And I, I proved it based on the, the local energy conservation. It doesn't violate any of the uh, symmetry which uh, people talk about. As a result, when we came out with this thing, I show that that these variations in any equation which we are trying to determine the variation of a constant, they are canceling each other. Because of the cancellation of them, you cannot determine why if you, if you keep the speed of light constant. That means you are fixing that function which I which relates other to be constant. If that is constant there, that will automatically become constant in all the other coupling constants. Right. As a result, if you constrain one to be constant, then all will be constant. So you are wasting your time trying to determine it. So you have to allow all of them to vary. And when you allow all of the coupling constant to vary, you find in these, whatever experiment I could think of, I even went to the United States to National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is supposed to be the custodian of the standards in, in, in the US, and they couldn't find any experiment which can determine this with the kind of accuracy which is required for, because they are not varying a whole lot. They are varying extremely small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, this is another objection people have made, uh, and rightly so. So tire light and co-varying constant both have been rejected based on certain things. And I'm saying those things are not present in my model. They have been taken care of, and this is, this is what has to be explained. But then they also tell what you need to do in order to convince the readers or physicists or astronomers 
that he, this is a genuine model worth mm -hmm. taking seriously. That is, prove it on CMB, cosmic microwave background. Cosmic microwave background is supposed to be precision cosmology. It determines with high precision. So I, I worked on that. It is it is a very difficult task because when you even a simple model, not simple, a lambda CDM is a, a fairly difficult model, but my model is somewhat more difficult. But to really develop a code for that is a long-term task. So what I have taken, I have taken something which is called baryon acoustic oscillation. I, I'm sure you, you, you are familiar with that thing. Mm -hmm. This is an offshoot of CMB. It's the one part of CMB which is the baryon acoustic oscillation. So I have taken that part which is easy to handle and it has two things. Baryon acoustic oscillation gives the angular size of the anisotropies in, in the observations. Mm -hmm. So I am able to match that. And those anisotropies also propagate in the formation of the galaxies or distribution of galaxies. Mm -hmm. So that one also I have fitted in based on the data which is available to me. And I find it fits that very well. So at least I can't say that I have done CMB completely, but at least there's a hope it will fit that data as well. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I had a question about the function relating all of these constants. Is there an analytical form to this function? Right? Yes. That is to say, you can just write it down yeah. with a pen and paper. It's in the, it's on yes, paper. yes, it's very simple. It has a, it has a, it has the exponential function, which is asymptotically approaching in the past to a constant value. At, at this point, it is expo uh, exponentially decreasing. So it, okay. has a, it has a value, say, if you go in the past, its value for the speed of light will be about four, four times what it is currently is. And currently is and now at this point it is of course what you observe which is the speed of light mm -hmm. but if you take the curve it is asymptotically going to the four value and at this point it is i and it will keep increasing in, in decreasing in the, uh, in the in the future right so is there kind of a physical interpretation to now you know that the speed of light or you suppose that the speed of light was higher in the past how does that affect the way that you look at observations that come from a time where the speed of light was faster? Yeah, the thing is the speed of light and the Planck constant, gravitational constant, and the Boltzmann constant, they all were higher at that time. Mm -hmm. See, the speed of light was four times, if it is four times high, it's not exactly four times, but just I'm giving you an example. Right. Or it is 3.67 or 8, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but about that. But that is only to the point which I can extrapolate it, up to the point of, say, the CMB and all that. But there could be a phase transition in the universe, and suddenly now we may have another function which might describe this one. Right. So, but up to the point where I, I have used it, up to the, um, the uh, CMB, for example, it is, it is that function. But say it is 4, in case of um, the Planck constant, it will be then 16. It is squared. Same Boltzmann constant, it will be 16. And for gravitational constant, it will be 4 times 16, 64. Mm -hmm. So it is increasing in that. And when you try try to put them in any equation you will find most of the time they are canceling each other okay so the fact that you know the cmb comes from the time of recombination so it kind of acts as the smoke screen that blocks all information that comes from before that time so this function describes the correlation between the constants up to that point but you know any time before that there could be some kind of uh, inflection point that changes your understanding uh I believe it might have inflection point at beyond the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. That's where we don't know because when you go there, you have 
Beyond that point, there are no baryons. There are no uh, no matter. You don't know dark matter exists or not at that point. You don't know what is there. So it is everything is unknown beyond that point. And baryons and all that are created just before the BBN, a Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So I don't know whether it will go that far or not because in in the case of inflation theory this value might be quite different i'm not sure mm -hmm. now you mention in your paper that uh, this function kind of comes from assuming a matter dominant universe so i just have uh, questions about what about other eras of our universe does the function also kind of take that into account because right now if i'm not mistaken we're in like an energy dominated universe where in the dark. past, like we were in a or like dark energy, dark past energy we were dominated. in a matter-dominated mm -hmm. universe, and then when the universe quote-unquote began, it was a radiation era dominant. So do you take all of those separate eras into account when you put, make this function, or are you simply... No, no, no. This function is valid everywhere, not for that, that, that region only. Okay. What I have shown in there is the how the energy densities vary. That function is present whether you are using energy density of the radiation or metal or dark energy. Actually, there is no d dark energy in the form which lambda CDM model has, has. It is in a different form because it's the, it's the constant which is involved in defining this function. Mm -hmm. that, fun that is the one which is <clears throat> really, if you see it, represents a, some kind of a dynamic dark energy, you might say. You oh. can, you, when you write the Friedman equation of the lambda CDM model and the model I have proposed, you can then see if you want to correlate lambda, you will find it, it, is, it involves the Hubble constant, Hubble parameter in that as well, A dot by A. As a result, it is, it is, you can see it is perhaps something related to that. But it is a totally different format. So before we get into the real nitty gritty of your, uh, of your theory, because I'm very, I have so many questions on like the actual implementation of the little things. Maybe we can just discuss what is the current model of our universe, the Lambda CDM model? How do we currently understand it? What does it describe? And what are the major flaws of the current model with data such as JWST? Okay, current model is came into existence in the form we, are, we have now after the Hubble uh, Space Telescope was launched because then it determined that definitely our universe is expanding and not only expanding, the expansion rate is increasing. Previous to that, it was thought that, okay, we have matter in the universe. The matter is gravitational, has gravitational attraction, and gravitationally, it is going to be attracting, so any explosion or whatever big bang which has happened, will eventually slow down and come to a halt and then the universe will start to collapse again. So they call it, there will be a deceleration of the universe as time progresses. So they call it deceleration parameters. But what happened that when we observed this, the data which Hubble gave it determined that no, it is really expansion rate is increasing, not decreasing. So how do we explain that? That's where all the theories about cold dark matter, the dark energy and all that. Dark matter came from another way because some rotational curves in the galaxies, they were not able to explain with, with the observed luminous uh, matter we had, or whatever other way we can account for the matter, they could not explain those rotational curves 
So that's, that's where people said there must be some invisible metal there, the dark matter. And it is five times the, four or five times the normal matter. Anyway, but this thing, other thing, but matter is, no matter what matter it is, it's gravitationally it is attracting. So it is still going to, to eventually stop the expansion of the universe and it should start to collapse sometime in the future. So there should be deceleration of the universe, not expansion. Acceleration. Come Hubble thing and acceleration is happening, so it has to be explained somehow. So that's where they have to put in something which will be really countering the uh, deceleration or attraction. That's where the dark energy came. Dark energy, which was introduced by Einstein and later on rejected by him, that was brought in to really save this model and that's the way this model came and since then i think it is explaining most of the observation in in the universe we have seen so that's the i could say briefly what is the origin of that so uh, what, what are the model. flaws in the lambda cdm model what what don't they explain i know very many famous things like it, it makes up a lot of things like primordial black holes and like for the early galaxies that we see in the universe, for them to make sense, we need to add a lot of these, how do I say, spices to the Lambda CDM model to make it work. So are, are there, I mean, apart from these spices, maybe you could describe some of these famous spices that we need to add to the model. But apart from that, does it get anything just wrong? Or is it just like, we need to improve on it a little bit? Uh, problem, major problem comes in conceptually. What is this dark energy? What is this dark matter? Has it been detected? People have been trying to find a lot of ways to explain this dark matter. Maybe it is a millions and millions and billions of tiny black holes which are sitting there around and they might be creating the dark matter. But all the experiments which have been tried to detect that have, have, have failed to show dark matter. Same about dark energy. Dark energy is also something which is uh, not clear where from it comes and why it is so much. For example, this dark energy concept or lambda presently, which is we are using now, constant value. Firstly, it is a constant value. Energy density of dark energy is constant. How can something remain constant? when something is expanding, where from this extra energy is coming. Okay, mm. we know in general relativity and cosmology, energy is not conserved, so that's fine. Maybe it is drawing the energy from the uh, quantum field theories uh, vacuum energy, which is an infinite source of energy. Maybe we should include that when we say energy conservation. But then during the inflation period, the same kind of dark energy, which is responsible for this inflation effect, is about 100, 100 orders of magnitude, 120 orders of magnitude higher, not 120 times, 120 orders of magnitude higher than this current dark energy. So there are so many things, it appears to a lot of people that somehow we are trying to fit the data by invoking certain things which are not correct. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, until we have something better than what we have, we have to live with it. So science does not develop assuming you everything you have done is wrong, but it is based on, you can throw it out everything and then what do you have? The people will have 200 other models which partially explain this, partially explain that, but Lambda CDM model is the best tool we have at present. Mm -hmm. There may be improvements because what I am suggesting also in my theory is not Lambda CDM is wrong, but it requires improvement. Uh, an example, simple example, I'm not comparing the level of those scientists who have done this kind of thing. Newton's law, Newton's law of physics or dynamic or static law, all these, they are still very important in everyday life. Mm -hmm. You can't say 
oh, Einstein has proven Newton's law is wrong, so you throw them out. No, we still need them. We always use them all the time. But if you are thinking of GPS, and if you don't make the corrections which are predicted by general relativity, you will be off very quickly from your GPS path. You want, your, your GPS will become useless hmm. within a day or two if you don't have those corrections. So, you know, this is what I'm trying to say that the improve, this is what I'm suggesting is an improvement on that, not basically changing completely the philosophy. Dark energy, yes, dark energy, maybe not in that form, but I'm, I'm bringing a, another constant which is defining this function, which covariant constant, covariant coupling constant thing, that itself you can see it plays a role as if it is dark energy. Now, you can ask me why it is there, where from it comes. But it is maybe have more rationale because you are now saying, oh, the constants are varying, constants are evolving. As a result, maybe the dark energy has a, some kind of origin from where it is coming rather than just a some fuzzy number, fuzzy constant in, in an equation. Right. Does your model uh, just? Oh, sorry. Very, very quick question. Mm -hmm. Does your model just completely eradicate lambda entirely, or does it like like and like very other constants to eradicate lambda, or is dark energy still prevalent in your model? Lambda is not there. Lambda is not there, and lambda that's the dark energy constant, there. right? If I'm not, not dark energy constant. But if you study the equation, the Friedman equation, then where the lambda would be, you find my constant is showing up along with something else with that. Okay, so it is not that directly, but you can definitely say because it is behaving totally differently because it is not a static constant as the lambda is, it, is, it has a dynamic nature in that. So you can correlate that because when you write the equation, you find, okay, what, what has changed in this equation? So you can relate, but really it is not the dark energy in the in the, normal sense okay right earlier you mentioned that people were trying to fit the data that was the the new data coming from the hubble telescope um, a famous problem in the field is the hubble tension where you know measuring the hubble constant one way yields a different result uh, when you measure it in a different way so does your theory provide any insight on this tension that's a very good question. Now, the tension, the I have only fitted limited number, limited amount of data. And what I have done, I have taken the same value for fitting the James Webb data as the supernova, supernovae type 1a data. So both the thing, because I don't have any other way of doing it. I am not able to do the CMB fit yet, and I have taken the same H, um, Hubble constant for fitting the um, baryonic acoustic oscillation, uh, oscillation data, and they are all working together. But the Hubble uh, constant itself, unless I have a lot more uh, analysis done, like especially the CMB. CMB is the one which is the one which will provide really whether that data is correct or not. Of course, as I said, part of the CMB is baryonic acoustic oscillation. It, in that one, when I'm using a particular value, which I derived from supernovae, it fits that, it is fine, but I have not done precision cosmology yet. So I cannot say whether it will not have that tension. Right, so it's possible that once having done this precision cosmology that your model does in fact yield, uh, it, it propagates this tension. Uh, or it in, propagates or it, it eliminates. It might. It appears right. to, at this point, it appears that whatever data I have analysis, a single Hubble constant is able to give me consistent results. Mm -hmm. But unless I have done precision one, then I cannot say that that Hubble tension is gone. And Hubble tension is also something which could arise because the physics is evolving with time. If that is happening, then you will see that H0 doesn't have to have the same value also, which we are insisting on. Mm -hmm. Right. So what would it mean 
for astronomy as a field if this tension were to be resolved? The Hubble tension is to be resolved. Yeah. I think I think that that will be something very important, but I don't think it will be life changing for astronomers, although they have put a lot of a lot of significance to this. But uh, as I said, that there are so many other things which are more worrying to us, like the the this uh, dark energy and dark matter and some other parameters we use. For example, in if you consider the Planck data, the CMB anisotropy power spectrum, they use so many parameters, they say they are able to extract so many parameters out of the anisotropy, this power spectrum which we observe. Other people would say, if you have enough parameter, you can fit anything. Right. So, the, there are two ways of looking at it, that because we have such a complex shape, we are able to get more information about unknown about the universe. Somebody who doesn't like that approach, he will say you have, you have used so many parameters to fit the data. So I can also use certain parameter to fit that data. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't know. I think there there are questions about that. But at the moment, I think I still very respectful for what people are doing, and and they have uh, obtained a lot of information and. I, I believe if we do the same kind of calculation, these numbers might be somewhat different, but they would be able to, to fit the data. I won't have dark energy parameter will not be there, for example. The, or I would still have dark matter part of it, but not dark energy in there. But something else might I might need when I'm fitting that. I feel right. like it's, it's, it's quite... Um... It's quite amazing to actually even sit here talking to you about this because it's like for all throughout our like undergraduate lives. And I, I feel like most people who have ever been through school get taught that laws are laws and they don't change. And things that we understand, right, like a, like a, a, lot, a lot of the theories that we have are more or less set in stone is at least how we're taught. There's a very, very famous diagram which is uh, the energy density versus like the scale factor of the universe. I'm just going to like show it for one second for the video listeners. But um, it basically, and it's mentioning exactly what you were mentioning, how the dark, how the green line right there, the dark energy density was basically constant through the entire time. And how we were taught in our astrophysics class, Parker and I last year, like how important and like integral this plot is, basically showing you how these energy densities change. And now you're like, oh, by the way, yeah, we can just do away with that whole thing. And the plot still makes sense. I, I think you have a good point. But at the same time, when you are a student, we have to tell you to learn something as if it is unchangeable. If we don't, then you will not learn anything. Then, the, once you have reached a stage, you have learned something, then you can think of changing it. You have to first mm -hmm. learn the things, the laws, the way people have developed up to now with their, with their talent or intelligence and standing on shoulders of the past performance and so on. But eventually, eventually, you are the one who is going to decide whether they are right or not. But if you are put in the confused state, oh, Newton's law, we don't know, oh, Newton's law, may, they are not right, uh, because we have already shown that they are wrong, Einstein showed it, so you would say, what, why are you teaching me this thing if it is not right? So I think we have to tell our student as if it is cut in stone, but I, I normally tell my students, see, this kind of the question you are raising, I will say, you are the one who is going to determine in future whether they are really right or not. Mm -hmm. Instead of telling them that they are right forever, I say these are right as we understand the mm -hmm. physics now or chemistry or whatever we have now. This is the our basis. 
but they may you may find they are not right they are not good for everything so you you are the one who is going to be determining it whether it's right or not it seems as though answer. <laughs> <laughs> it seems as though the more you look into the physics right you start off with newton then you go to euler lagrange general relativity and it, it just keeps going it seems as though things just get more and more complicated do you believe that there is in fact one theory that can explain everything or are we always going to be chasing the next theory that can encompass even more and more as we set sights on larger parts of the universe yeah we should ask that for stephen hawking he is just no more <laughs> but really he wanted to have a theory of everything even the movie was produced mm -hmm. theory of everything yeah. You remember yeah but actually one of the thing we see that things are becoming more and more complicated. You might say that at the same time, we have more resources at our disposal, which allow us to handle such complicated things. So the universe is fairly complicated. Our job is to really understand it in as simple way as possible. So this is this is what we are, but a simple way, as simple way as possible, sometime is, which we call Occam's razor, for example. It's simpler the theory, better it should be. Uh, uh, but really, we know you can't use Newton's law for GPS. Most of it is still Newton's law. Your center line is still being running around with that, but you need those corrections to be done. For, mm -hmm. for it to work properly. So I think my, my position is, yes, it is becoming more complicated, but then we have tools at our disposal to handle those kind of things. Example is, now, for a, I don't have to calculate Christopher symbols with my hand, which I did when I was, because there were no analytical tools available to find it. So when I was young, I had to derive all the Christopher symbols manually. Wow. Now I put Maple or Mathematica and I get those Christopher symbols in my hand. Einstein equation, I can have any kind of metric. And I can plug that in and I will get the Einstein equation based on that or, or the, um, the Einstein uh, tensor mm -hmm. from that. And Cristobal symbols, all the things we will get, Ritchie, Ritchie symbols, everything I can get from that. Previously, I had to do means I wouldn't even dare to do any too much complicated because Einstein theory itself is already complicated. Now I change the metric to make it more difficult. It will, and this is the challenge because I change the metric. In my case, if you go, the metric is different. In the metric, it is a, it is a, the the speed of light is dynamic. As a result, it's not constant. It's not sitting there. So I have my metric has changed there. Not only that, this I am also measuring the distance using the speed of light. So distance is also becoming dynamic. So that metric changes. As a result, Einstein equations become different. As a result, your Friedman equation become different. I have a I have a quite a because you, you mentioned the varying speed of light quite a lot, and maybe this is like a good segue into like now actually talking about what kind of led you into your paper. Because I'm, first of all, just very confused about... So I always understood the speed of light as just nothing really to do with light, but more so to do with like a restraint on the universe. Like this is the, this is the speed limit of the universe. It has nothing really to do with light. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but how does... How do you view the speed of light? And how do you explain that it is dynamic in the sense that it is changing? What is actually changing? Okay, a speed of light, constancy of a speed of light was derived by Einstein from Michelson Morley experiments. Right. If we go back to that and we say it is constant. Yeah. And you know very well and we have studied that too, I'm sure, that a special theory of relativity is locally ap applicable, not generally applicable. Generally applicable is general relativity. So we, when we say that 
speed of light is evolving, locally is still constant. But that locality itself is moving with time. As a result, to keep that light fixed, which we have observed today, that locality is not the same in the past or won't be in the future. So it is, can be evolutionary without violating the Lorentz invariance. Mm. So what do you picture when, okay, that actually did answer a good question, that, that actually did answer a good part of how do you explain the varying nature of the speed of light. But I guess this question might be a little more philosophical and is very dependent on how you think about it. But it's like, what is really the speed of light? Like, what is really being restricted? Is it these massless particles in space that are that just have this barrier that can't go faster? Like, how do you look at it? Because personally, again, maybe you, you, you can give me your two cents right after. Personally, what I just mentioned, that's more or less how I view it. I more or less view it as like the Higgs, Higgs field is like a deterrent it's like a it's like a decelerator and any particle with mass is like getting decelerated by that field and like can't go to the quote unquote fastest unbounded speed and anything that doesn't interact with the higgs field such as a photon can simply pass by it but then there arises so many questions about you know well why is it as as fast as it is you know do you have any Again, these are just philosophical, just how you think about it really is not really a fundamental right or wrong. But do you have any insights? Any, any ways think, that you think about this? I think you have, you have brought in something very interesting. You know, we have studied a terminal velocity of particle in a fluid. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. For example, if you drop, if you have a particle, you drop a particle in a fluid, it will accelerate up to some point, then it will achieve a constant velocity, that is the terminal velocity. So one way to see it, okay, we have some kind of cosmic fluid in which the photons are traveling. And photons are trying to go the maximum speed, but they can't because this, there's a cosmic drag on these photons. Now, cosmic drag on the photons might limit the speed of light. Also, it might do something that is the, the tired light effect, that photons are losing energy. They are trying to go as fast as they can, but when they are trying to do it and they can't, they are losing that energy. Albeit very small, but that is why you have this tired light effect. Why the red shift is coming, but your photons are losing energy as a result of that. So there are two things which it explains what you have yourself said, based on what you have proposed, that explains two things. Why the speed of light is limited, how much it is limited, what that field is, that you can you can calculate yourself. But really, in that, the tired light will happen if it is that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So why did people reject, because I know, again, just a brief mention of tired light, correct me if I'm wrong, basically mentions that redshift is proportional to distance, right? Like the farther you are, like the more it mm -hmm. redshifts or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So light is, as you mentioned, losing energy as it travels. So you mentioned earlier on in the podcast that many people for a while rejected the tire, tired light theory. Why, may I ask? Why it was rejected is very simple. They thought, what is the mechanism of light getting tired? The known mechanism is the scattering, Compton scattering, for example. It is scattering happens as a result, part of the photon energy is goes to the electron, okay? And it loses that energy. So if it is traveling a lot of distance and there are, although in the universe there are very few electrons which it can scatter with, but there is some electrons, free electrons there, it can definitely have chance to scatter. So that was, scattering was proposed, Compton scattering or Thompson scattering, you might say, at that energy. 
it was proposed as a mechanism of losing the energy. And if you have a scattering, that is going to cause the blurring of mm. the object from which the light is coming. That is one thing. Secondly, the that formula which was derived for this retired light was okay to fit when the redshifts were very low because all of the formulae they reduced to a Hubble formula in the in in the very low uh, Z or redshift range. But when the more distant objects were observed and they could not fit the the tire light uh, model. Oh that's the reason it was rejected. So your model works, is it because you're, because I believe in your paper you propose two models, you propose the covariant coupling constants with the tired light and you presented another model with the tired light, right? You presented yeah. two. So was it that those additional models that helped the tired light to work or why did you use tired light if T you think that it tired light? Explain? I use tired light because tired light, despite the fact that it could not explain the redshift of the supernovae, it was able to explain the James Webb observation. Hmm. So if can it can explain James Webb and it cannot explain the earlier one, so maybe you need a hybrid of the two models. So what I did first, first thing what you would do, you would take the tire light model and combine with the lambda CDN model, which is the standard model everybody right. uses, and see whether this hybrid model can explain supernovae data as well as the James Webb data, but it couldn't. Mm -hmm. That's when we say, okay, I was already working on the covariant coupling constant in another context. And then when I I I said, okay, let, let me try to combine the covariant coupling constant with the, the tire light and see what happens. And that's where the surprise came. And the surprise was that that everything was kosher except the age of the universe. But age of the universe, by the way, when I used lambda CDM model combined with hybrid, it also increased it. It increased it to about 20 giga years, not 26 mm -hmm. giga years, 26.7 giga years. So I know that there are some important, you know, fundamental eras in like the like in in our universe, such as the um like such as recombination or matter radiation decoupling and all of these things or at least how we learned it in class occurred at specific redshift values like for example i believe recombination was 1100 or something like that like they all occur at certain redshift values now in our understanding with the current understanding the redshift value is linked to some certain value of time period of the universe that you have now extended by quite a lot so how does that get affected? Because my uh, current understanding is that only like a couple hundred million years after the after the Big Bang is when all this stuff decoupled. But now you're saying that the universe actually started 10, 15 billion years before that. So how does how do those redshift values like change based on your model? Or how are they affected by your model? Yeah, actually recombination a model recombination is still happens at redshift 1100 because you need that temperature there of 3000 Kelvin. Okay. So 3000 Kelvin will happen at the redshift of 1100. But then when does 1100 happen? Mm -hmm. Right. That's very important. Exactly. Did it happen at 380,000 years after the Big Bang? Or much later. Mm -hmm. So there, I have I have produced many curves in there. I don't um, uh, I don't have out of my head what it is, but yes, there's a change of timeline. Redshift versus versus the age has changed dramatically. For example, just recently I had somebody asking me about the. Uh, the cosmic dawn time. Mm 
cosmic dawn time is when the reionization started of the universe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So cosmic dawn time at presently is considered from about 1 billion years to perhaps 50 uh, million years duration in that period. And the redshift is considered to be from about 15 to or about 7 or 8. Say 10. Let's consider an, a value of 10. Sure. Okay. If you consider in a, in the new model which I have proposed, this will happen at redshift 100. So you won't see the cosmic oh dawn type characteristic which are predicted by lambda CDM model until you can observe down to or up to uh, Z equal to 100, redshift 100. Actually, I, I had somebody uh, some, somebody who has done this kind of work and I have some correspondence and he asked me this question. When cosmic dawn will happen in your model? So I wrote back to him, he's from Harvard, about this um, thing. So I said, yeah, it will happen at this. So essentially, you have a long way to go before you will see the universe is really evolving. Uh, the way so you have a whole lot of more time to build the galaxies so a product of your research is that the age of the universe has been pushed back you say okay now the universe started 26.7 billion years ago what kind of uncertainty analysis have you done on this so is it maybe like Yes, it's 26.7, but the error bars are huge, right? So really, we don't know. Or are, were, the, were the results pretty precise? No, the, if, if we increase the error bars, then you cannot fit the James Webb data. So okay. I, what, what I have done, because of the parameters I'm using in here are the two parameters I have to determine. One is a parameter which determines the covariant constant, that function, which is I have called alpha. I shouldn't have called alpha. Alpha is normally used for fine structure constant. And some people say, why did you do? Why did you use alpha? I said, I happen to come into my mind. I never knew that this paper will become important enough to get this kind of questioning. <laughs> so it came to my mind, and I said, let me put some numbers. Uh, some some parameter there, alpha. So alpha instead of lambda, we don't have lambda here, it is alpha instead, and then the h0. These are the two parameters determined by the supernovae data. So supernovae data, yes, there's some uncertainty in these data, and I have put those uncertainties in fitting it, and as a result, there's some uncertainty comes in the fitting in the values of the Hubble parameter and alpha as well. But those are very small. They are not going to change the finding significantly. They might change by a, they might change by one million, two million, five million years, but not a whole lot. They're, they're, those are very small. Oh wow, so that's fairly an accurate result then. Yeah, it is fairly accurate that way if it is. So I I'm I'm assuming the goal of your paper was not to change the age of the universe, right? It was to better fit the data that you saw from James Webb. Could you maybe take us through, like, I know you already mentioned very briefly about how you, you know, received the data, What, like you, you, you saw the process data one day and you're like, oh, you know, a lot of people are having these concerns. Maybe I can apply my own models on it. But how does, um, how, do, how do you like think of that over, how do you say, like, I'm kind of getting lost in thought here. It was it's mainly just trying to understand how does how how does the process work of you taking data and actually starting being like okay this is what I'm going to do. Do you lay out a goal that you have for your paper and then does the goal change over time or did you always know what you wanted to do from the very get go? See, goal of the paper is not to fit the data in one way or the other. Goal is to see whether the new model 
can fit the data. If it doesn't fit, that's the way it is. So, mm -hmm. for example, first thing I tried was to fit with the Lambda CDM model and Tired Light because they are well known. Uh, this model Lambda CDM is so. Why should you reinvent something? Just try to reach hybrid these two, mm -hmm. and then I couldn't fit the data. James Webb data I couldn't fit. I could fit the data of the hybrid model could fit the data from supernovae or Pantheon plus data they call it. I was able to fit it very well. All the four models which I have tried with and without the uh, tired light were able to fit the data very well. So they all qualified to be tested further. Mm -hmm. That is to me is the basic qualification. If it doesn't fit that data very well, then I think you might you are wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Then I, I tried Lambda CDM hybrid model with tried light. It didn't fit James Webb data. And I said, okay, it doesn't fit. I would then I have the covariant constant model with, uh, combined with the, the thing, and it happened to fit the data very well. That was a surprise to me. And even if it didn't fit the data. I would still would have published it that this is what we have tried and it didn't work well. Even though the, if it that was the case, nobody would notice. Oh, you don't fit the data. So what's your age? Whatever you have determined is useless. For example, twenty billion years, which is determined by lambda CDM model and the tired light model combined, is useless. And if I presented that result somewhere, somebody, oh yeah, it doesn't fit the data anyway. What's what's the use of having this? Um, right. extra is nobody would notice it but because it happened to fit the data and because it has given a age which is so much larger than the currently accepted value suddenly it, it was and because our media relation people were able to pick up that and knew what the hook is for the media to really get attracted to they knew how to get other people attracted to that's their job Mm -hmm. So that's the way it, it got so much publicity. I never expected that. To me, it is just, I have so many other papers published in the same journal. Nobody would notice them. You didn't even mention the whole age of the universe in your paper. Like no, it was, no, in it was the title, even, you know. The title, title wasn't even, it was nothing to do with the age. It was just early observations. It doesn't even talk about their hybrid models. It right. doesn't even talk about covariant constant, nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just a very benign title there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The so really is, is the attention that you're receiving for this, is this something that you're grateful for or is this something that kind of fell upon you and now you have to deal with it? I think it's two things at the same time. <clears throat> okay. W w one thing is, yes, I'm grateful for it because otherwise you will, my research will never be noticed. But at the same time now, I, I am under pressure to really deliver. Mm -hmm. right. And some of the things I'm not as good at, but I'm trying to do it because I have no team. It's not that I'm 20, 30, or 40 people who are associated with me and we say, oh, I'm not best in this. Can you do this for me? Can, let's look into it together. I have to do th those things which I'm not good at even now. So, for example, bow I can do, baryonic acoustic oscillation. That's fairly simple I can do. But doing CMB... I and my student are working very hard. The problem is even the Lambda CDM model, which is relatively straightforward, is difficult to do. Now to modify those equations, there are hundreds of equations and perhaps 30, 40, 50,000 lines of codes to really have all these things done by limited number of people, me and my student, graduate student is is challenge. It's really challenge. I'm hoping, I'm hoping through the podcast like yours and media publicity, some people will notice that, okay, maybe we should get involved and see what, maybe what he's saying makes sense. Let's try to do it. But most people, what we will do is, as many people, critics have done, if they don't understand the paper properly, they only find what the the, they appear to be superficial problems like tired light had these problems so this your model should have this problem and because constant 
variation could not be measured on gravitational constants, so how can it be there? So all this kind of criticism, though, most people will try to prove that I am wrong rather than I'm correct. But I'm hoping there are a few people might come out who say, okay, let's try to see. Maybe something serious exists here. Right. I must say it is very impressive that you've been able to do all this in a, in a department of one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm surprised that people, I mean, especially now that you've already released the paper, I'm surprised that people are not like reaching out and being like, hey, I'll help because they might have a chance to be the face of, you know, the, the a new model of the universe. Has nobody like like reached out to be like, hey, by the way, you're not good at CMB, I am. Let me be like second author on your paper or something like that. Yeah, I think this is this is something firstly, I, I'm hoping somebody will come this time. Initially what happens, you have a huge investment in one concept. And you are, you are, firstly, you want to see, first approach is to see, oh, maybe this model has some flaws in it. Mm -hmm. People are determining, finding superficial flaws. When I have to find somebody who seriously reads it and say, okay, these are not the flaws. And the deficiency which are there, means something which I have not shown, CMB, for example, if it doesn't, then, this is why this paper which I have read, written in uh, Baryonic Acoustic Oscillation, this paper, hopefully it will be published soon in APJ, Astrophysical mm -hmm. Journal. They mm -hmm. are, at the moment, they are reviewing it. Hopefully, they don't reject it. But if that comes, then there may be hope that people will say, okay, if it is explaining this, maybe it can explain CMB as well, full CMB and isotropic power spectrum. So there is something, but at the same time, if I have heavy investment in whatever I have done, I don't want to easily accept somebody else's proposition. Mm -hmm. right. Especially, I'm looking, I'm a PhD student or I have a, I am a postdoc. I'm not going to get a job if I am trying to pursue something which is completely non-traditional. So mm -hmm. I have to really keep doing what others are doing, which is mm -hmm. self, this, this always happens. But then there will be, this is the advantage of this media thing. Somebody will be, out of so many people, will think, maybe I have to check. Maybe there's some meat into it, mm -hmm. okay? So that's why I feel this publicity is very good. We'll find somebody who is interested. This might be a little, um, I don't know, like a, Pretty wild question because I guess, I mean, nobody really knows they're wrong until they are. But just a, just like an idea, what would you, what would you, I mean, I guess to prove your, I, I mean, in astrophysics, to prove models right is just to, to collect more data and to use those models on the data, right? And just like say that, hey, this, this model works. I guess my question, I mean, maybe, maybe your answer is pretty trivial and it's just more data, but what do you think? Like, is there like one or two ways or any fundamental way that your model could be proved wrong? And someone says, oh, by the way, this, so this doesn't work. Or like, like what, do you, what do you think are, because I, I, I'm always very curious on people that write new things to being like, oh, you should know what can go right and what can go wrong. So I guess, my, I mean, I, obviously you've done a lot of peer review. You've, I mean, you published the paper, so it's not like you haven't thought of it. But I guess my question is, where do you think this paper could go wrong? Just hypothetically, of course. Actually, the, one of the things I know very well, no, no theory is good forever. Someday it will be proven wrong right. or it will need, need improvement, improvement on top of it. Okay. Right. So I, I feel, so this theory which I have proposed or whatever model I am proposing, I believe I will be very happy if somebody can genuinely prove it is wrong and it doesn't. The problem is that people are going to only partially take into account and then try to prove it is wrong. As superficially people have been trying to do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, public, not publication or blogs or 
articles on the web I have seen which are criticizing this on superficial basis like oh there are too many uh, parameters in there oh mm-hmm. oh but we have already proven that tired light has these problems so if how can this model be so they are similarly what will happen covariant coupling constant part is difficult for people to understand properly how mm-hmm. it really affects the early universe and late universe and noon universe and all those kind of things are a little bit difficult and people might not use it correctly and there they can very easily show oh it doesn't work it's wrong mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so this is where my my fear is but if somebody can genuinely prove it is wrong i will be very happy then we go ahead and do something else instead mm-hmm. of really wasting our time on this right and and if somebody does genuinely prove it wrong it also shows that they've really taken the time to fully consider what you've put on the table so that yeah. is kind of a way to honor your work in in a way uh, exactly that itself is a very important thing but see this is for example uh, you can take lambda cdm model and try to apply it to some certain certain situation and you will say it is wrong so it, no model right. applies everywhere everywhere right right Isn't that's that why odd? you don't have theory like, yeah. of everything right that's why you don't have a theory of everything but i find it isn't it quite odd that like all of these theories work for like the supernovae data for example but then not for maybe you can just go over one because I, I know parker and i have read the paper but maybe for like our audience what part of the james webb data led you to be like or made you be like oh the lambda models and all the current models doesn't fit this what ex- what data exactly did you see that you know m- yeah. made you even start this paper in the first place yeah see what we measure in the sky is not the size physical size we only measure angular sizes right now this is the angular sizes are then use based on the model you have to derive the physical sizes mm. now when these angular sizes which were measured by james webb telescope were fit in the in the uh, lambda cdm model they were showing the physical size of the galaxies would be extremely are very small compared to what they expected them to be physical sizes should be because the way angular diameter distance um, appears it will it will show the physical sizes to be much larger so when you say expected them to be sorry to cut you out here but when you said expected wh- wh- where do they get that priori information from like what what no, do they expect but, but, using their model they would say this should be the size of the object at this particular redshift angular size should be this much if the physical size was that mm-hmm. if i'm seeing a well evolved massive galaxy i would see its size should be at least 10 20 kiloparsec okay okay now you are seeing it to be it it turns out to be much smaller than that based on your model then you are going to say why it is so much smaller mm. why it is so much smaller so you are thinking it is much more compact than than it is really so now different models will give you different physical sizes so our model gives a larger physical sizes and we say yeah these are the physical sizes which should be there for this kind of galaxy with so much mass is uh, this morphology is what it is then it should be this size and that was the problem with the uh the james webb uh, i mean lambda cdm and then what people were trying to do they are trying to see how such galaxies can be created in such a short time which are mm. very small right. and very massive and all that but they were not very small it is their model was showing it was very small mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, we usually ask our guests as 
concluding remarks uh, to f- for all of the listeners out there who are you know currently studying physics. You know, what is the one piece of advice that you would pass down uh, to the young students out there? Actually, I I see. I would say that learn what you are taught well before you challenge what is wrong with that. Mm. So you you have to know the present status of physics, technology, biology, or whatever you are doing, and then only you are in a position to see what is wrong in there. But if you if you always right from the beginning you start thinking oh people are already confused so or maybe maybe this is useless no they are not useless whatever they have done is very powerful very useless in the context they have done it but you are the one who are going to determine what is wrong in this and improve it and we are counting on you that's what I right. would say to my students and I always say the same thing whenever I meet my students. Sorry, I just have one question on, 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 on the James Webb, if you don't mind. Um, I was just thinking about what the, the thing you said where we're basically looking at this new data that shows us that our models are incorrect. So mm-hmm. what, what part of James Webb showed it? Was it peering into like earlier universe than Hubble was? Like what part of, like what were you, yeah, what, what galaxies were you looking at? Were you looking at these early form, formed galaxies in the universe with James Webb and were like, hey, like the data doesn't match because couldn't Hubble do the same thing? Or what did James do different that Hubble did? Hubble could not see that deep. Why? Deep. The because deep. the redshift which is happening at, at from cosmic dawn time is in infrared range and far infrared range, mm. whereas Hubble is not capable of going into the far infrared range. And moreover, Hubble is not as large a telescope as this one is. So this uh, James Webb a- is able to really see deeper into this space, far back toward the cosmic dawn. So that's the advantage of that mm. and that's why it was launched and really to see to confirm the J, uh, the lambda cdm projections actually the impossible early galaxy pro- problem was seen even with the hst hubble space telescope but that was not totally confirmed it was just say okay maybe they are few galaxies which are showing like that. Let's go and see deeper in the space and see whether we resolve this problem or this problem is enhanced. So this was greatly enhanced. Not only the size of the galaxy, but density of galaxies. Uh, that was all these numbers are coming out which are beyond the predictions, original prediction. Now there is, people are scurrying around and trying to change the models to to really fit it and some are able to do it okay that's why i'm predicting that you won't see cosmic dawn until z equal to 100 Mm -hmm. and i don't know which telescope you will have which will see z equal to 100 it will be going to be a long time (laughs) now no no not really not it doesn't have to be the real thing is the radio telescopes are developing very fast see Mm. You cannot do infrared. You have to go into microwave and perhaps the further in the radio telescope range and see. They might, they will be able to see deeper in the space, not optical. Optical system will not work. Right, and, and there, there are there, there. observatories being built right now, like the exactly. square kilometer exactly. array that will be looking mm-hmm. into the radio universe. They are the kilometer thing, but they don't. They can be in space. These radios, the radio tele- uh, telescopes are being built for the space, in the space also. Not only in a geocentric orbit, they have plans of even heliocentric orbits. So oh, there, wow. there are a lot of things which can be done with that. So, But I don't think the, they will be able to have... I don't know. I, I'm not really knowledgeable so much about the 
the capability of these machines in 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 studying the morphology of, of galaxies. Mm -hmm. they, they might be able to determine something, but I don't know whether in detail they can do so. I shouldn't be there really commenting on that. You mentioned that you were shocked when you saw that the uh, covariant constants model plus the tired light model kind of worked. My question is, I guess, um, like, were you, what did you think about that whole thing? Because it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, like, uh, what's the word for it? Like, uh, eerie that you had just worked on the covariant constants model before that, and this new data comes out, and you apply it on it, and boom, it just, it, it gives you, like, the best data fit ever. Do you think that, like, that could be explored with other theories? Like, how how coincidental do you think that that is? Yeah, actually, I was working on covariant, covariant complete constant, but there was a flaw in those that uh, in the initial models which I had used had a flaw because I did say that speed of light is used for measuring distances, but in my uh, metric, I had not applied the variation of distance there in the metric. As a result, those models were not, uh, I myself found there were, there were some problem and, and they were not very satisfactory. But when this was done and I properly did the work on it and it was able to fit this ex extra data, uh, in the James Webb data, then that was a surprise, you might say. But bigger surprise was that it is giving or uh, age of the universe was turning out to be too high. That was my major problem, mm -hmm. which perhaps became an asset in, in the... Right. <laughs> if, right. You, if you consider in the retrospect, but really at that time, that was uh, somewhat of a concern to me. But then, you know, I have seen so many other models which I have worked with, they all give different age of the universe. So I said, so, so, so that's not a big deal about perhaps. Mm -hmm. Do you have maybe any concluding remarks on, I, I feel like, I feel like we've covered majority of your paper, you know, why you tackled it, how you tackled it, the models you used and, and what it showed at the end of it. Do you maybe have anything you maybe you want to leave the readers with or leave the listeners with about your paper, anything more maybe they would want to explore after reading your paper or just anything specifically about your research, about you that you just want to leave everyone with? Um, what, one of the things I just want to say about this, that if you want to do anything further about what I have done, then try to take it as a whole rather than in pieces. Mm. When you take in pieces, you are not going to get proper results. You have to take as a whole. For example, I, I have people criticizing the paper that okay if the age can also be determined with the age of the globular clusters globular clusters are the oldest cluster they are supposed to have been created many of them have created at the time of cosmic dawn you might say so their age should reflect the age of the universe as well but i would i would say these all these models, they are astrophysical models, they are dependent on the model and people have adjusted the age of the globular cluster or some oldest stars based on the constraint on the age of the universe. So whenever you get too much of age of a cluster or a star, you say, oh, it's, it must be wrong. I have to adjust the parameters to make sure it is within 13.8 giga years. When 13.8 giga year was not established and people were uncertain about the age of the universe, 7 to 20 giga years, they were saying before HST, Hubble Space Telescope, they were seeing, uh, or maybe there were a lot of predictions about 16, 18 mm -hmm. giga years of the age of certain stars. But uh, gradually they were all made to fit within the 13.8 giga year. They modified that. Normally, that's what you would do. Maybe something is wrong in my model. But now, 
that constraint is not there. So recently, somebody published a paper, actually it's not published here, it's in the archives, uh, Cornell um, preprint server. They, he, when he read my paper, he was getting age of global clusters of about 18 giga years. And he said, oh, this must be wrong. I can't believe, how can it be? So he just put it aside. When he saw my paper, he immediately wrote that paper and sent it to the preprint. He said, no, <laughs> I, I, I think there's, there's, it may not be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think this is where my suggestion for anybody is, you want to study something new and you want to dis say this is wrong, please study it in full and try to apply it in full, not piecemeal. That's my, my mm -hmm. concluding right. remark. So in a way, well, you're leading the charge for other people who have had results and, you know, computed the age of the universe and said, you know, this doesn't line up, so I'm just going to throw it away. But in fact, you know, maybe these results are in, are useful in a way. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a great thing that came out of your work. Um, but yeah, we, we, we thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to us today. It was uh, awesome to get to learn about your work. Thank you very much for inviting me on the show. And I'm grateful that you gave me a chance to present my work. Of Thank course. you. I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm, I hope every listener of this podcast does, like listens to this and does more research on the things that we've spoken about. I know there are a lot of terms that we didn't go into grave detail about, some we went into technical detail about and whatnot. But I think the whole point of this podcast, like I've said on a lot of previous podcasts before, is, is to make you interested in the subject. I think everybody is interested in the age of the universe. I mean, who isn't who is related to astronomy? So I feel like if you're even mildly interested in the things that we were talking about, you know, go research them yourself. Go look at it yourself because that's all that this is really, you know, insinuating you to do. And I feel like you've really given us the opportunity to do that. The amount that I've learned about the just how we've been thinking about the universal models just by reading your paper and talking to you today has been quite, it's been quite uh, eye-opening for me. And we really hope to speak to you next year after your Nobel Prize, because I seriously <laughs> feel it. I mean, if I mean, if more data comes out with James Webb, which I'm sure it will, and this starts fitting it better and better, I mean, who knows? Like, wh where do you think this will go? Do Do you think this can become like a staple? Again, this is a very vague question. This is a very up to you, how however you want to answer it type question. But where do you think? this theory can be taken? Do you think it can be the next theory or do you th still think that people should be continuing to like improve it here and there with a little bit? I, I, I feel that it will depend on, on how many people get interested. Like your listeners, I would say, if they want to, they have any confusion, they have any concern, they write to me instead of saying, relegating it into a dustbin or something. Mm -hmm. This is, that's let, if you have some concern that you feel we have not tried to answer or this doesn't have, or you are interested in doing further work and you are qualified to do that, yes, contact me. There might be some possibilities, you know, with, with uh, working together. I do have some, some funds, you know, which we can provide some support to people. Not a whole lot because we are I'm alone in, in the university here, but some kind of thing can be still worked out if, if somebody is genuinely interested and capable of doing right. something more. Yeah. So we will be putting your contact information in the description of this podcast. Um, so for all the listeners out there, thank you so much for uh, listening to this episode. Make sure to follow the podcast wherever you're listening to this. And uh, yeah, this has been episode number 114 of the Math and Physics podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And thank you, Dr. Gupta, for coming on the podcast today. And we will see you soon. Thank you very Bye, much guys. for letting see me ya. with your podcast. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.